also hate school. I am Hella Bar Carly. Merry Christmas to everyone and to all a Merry Christmas and a Happy Kwanzaa and a Happy Hanukkah and all of the cultural terms that we use to describe a full-fledged holiday extravaganza where everyone is included and nobody is excluded because we're not about exclusion here, we're about inclusion, even to the point that it's detrimental to our own belief systems and where our culturals d disintegrate and then what you have happen is, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna go down that route of a cultural rant and uh, <clears throat> get into some sort of nationalistic fervor. That's not what I was doing, that was a joke. Please back away right now, do not cancel me. So, <sighs> Well, I wanted to surprise everyone today uh, by revealing some positive news uh, that Spider, my cat, was in fact found after a week of being missed. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't say that, you know, I, 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 it's still a surprise if you don't watch The Fighter and the Kid, but yesterday uh, Brendan brought it up on the show and I had a good laugh watching them discuss it and make fun of me crying at a video that I sent them. Um, and in a picture, can we bring that picture up? Here's me after diving into a bush head first. Um, and I'll tell the story of that real quick. So it had been exactly a week since Spider went missing without a trace. And we'd looked everywhere, all around the block, you know, far and wide. We fielded calls that a cat that looked like ours 10 miles away was found dead in the street and maybe it could have hopped into an engine because apparently cats like to get into engines and because it's warm and it was like 38 degrees out one of these nights, you know, all the worst case scenarios happened as far as like, I lose the cat, you know, after only like a minute of turning my eyes towards another one, it's immediately out of the immediate vicinity and then um, it starts raining, you know, so if your cat was out and about, it's gonna start hiding. And then the next night it's 38 degrees, colder than it's been all year. So uh, if your cat was visible anywhere, it probably crawled up into an engine and went somewhere where it's not going to just come out, even if you're calling it because cats get nervous when they go into hiding mode, it becomes different. Um, you start looking up statistics on cats and see that actually there does come a point where even if they are hiding, they tend to come out because they get desperate for food. Uh, and uh, I think that's what ended up happening. So um, Luana organized a search party uh, on the suggestion of a lesbian neighbor of ours. She said, lesbians get shit done. You need more of them in your life. And she actually really validated that stereotype. I don't like to deal in cliches and stereotypes, but in this case, she really came through and was like, you need a flashlight, you need a ladder, you need this. And then she was coming through and helping us out and really, you know, giving us both great resources and suggestions such as have a search party. So, with about 10 people scanning the streets, somebody, um, actually this uh, this woman, Tammy, I believe was the first person to hear spider in a bush. Now, a bush that you've walked by a hundred times in your search for the cat, but unless you literally, you know, scour every single square inch of this hedge, this really thick, dense hedge that you can barely see into, it's just sort of, it's hard to justify whatever, spending an hour, you know, examining every inch of this thing because you then could do that to every piece of brush all over. But heard the meowing. Luana runs over and sees, uh, you know, shines her flashlight and confirms Spider's eyes are shining through the hedge. I get a call. Come over. I'm on the other side just in case, you know, the search party is scaring me. Well, I go to a different area that he could have ran into had he been scared. So I run over. They say he's in the, in the bushes. I crack open the bushes. It feels like ground zero in there. Dust and debris and all this shit getting all over my face. Uh, I'm, you know, inhaling dirt. And even with all these people around, like it was still hard to get the cat. We knew exactly where it was. And I, you're still like, where the fuck is it? Because if cats really want to hide from you, it's very easy for them to do that. So needless to say, we got the cat back. We were elated. I had basically resigned to the idea that I would never see Spider again and not know what happens. That's always, I think, the worst case scenario, to not know what happens. Um, now, and I've been down that road before of looking for cats for weeks and finding out basically they died, you know, long ago. And it's just very devastating. And as I said before, I tried to go out of my way to remain as calm as possible while still having the utmost concern for everything that happened, but know that you can't emotionally exhaust yourself in a few nights. It's like, yeah, stay up for a few nights and don't sleep. On that fourth day, you're going to be an emotional and mental wreck. So when we got Spider back, 
I didn't. Ant I anticipated being emotional, finding out that he was dead. Obviously, I would have cried and, and felt very devastated. And these things have an extra toll, even more than human death for me, specifically because it's a different feeling. I'm not going to say like, you know, uh, you know, my father dying, for example, wasn't as bad as a cat dying. But the thing with a pet is you feel responsible for it. So you 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 have this guilt and regret over the things that you could have done to prevent that. And you'll end up kicking yourself, you know, potentially for the rest of your life. So yeah, I was prepared to feel all that over again. and was bracing for that moment and trying to not emotionally exhaust myself. And then when we found Spider, you can play that clip. It was a big emotional moment. <laughs> Here's one, one is on the, on the <laughs> FaceTime with uh, her mom who had visited recently from Germany and met Spider as well, so she was very invested in the whole thing. He's like ripping chunks of food out uh, of the bowl. And you can hear me whimper a little bit in the background. I don't care. Yes, <clears throat> I cried. I will cry over cats. I tried not to cry while he was missing, even though I might have felt like it, but uh, you know, I think I can compartmentalize emotions pretty well and, and go, that's not the time. Don't waste that emotional energy right now because if some uh, cat's missing or a dog's missing, they need you to do stuff, not cry about it, okay? So couldn't be happier. What a Christmas miracle by the time that you have started listening to this it will have already been christmas so i hope you had a great christmas and i know it's a little late the jake when did the jake paul fight happen like last week <laughs> we don't need a hard answer all i'm saying is if it seems late i don't give a shit because this is just something that i think about and it relates to other stuff that i think about uh which is the notion of conspiracies and i also think that this is kind of a december 18th right okay so less than a week ago right um the notion of conspiracies and how that also kind of relates in this sense to discrediting someone and kind of being a Jake Paul hater. He beat Tyron Woodley by vicious knockout and immediately, as we saw with the Ben Askren fights, as we saw with, uh, I believe there was conspiracy about Nate Robinson, but basically people believe that Jake Paul is paying people to take a dive or to not knock him out. So he even put a $500,000 bonus clause in Tyron Woodley's contract saying, if you knock me out, you'll get this huge bonus. Um, people thought the Ben Askren fight was was staged and that Ben Askren took a dive. These were both hard KO knockouts. It wasn't like a TKO where he took a knee. It was like both these were like flatlined. You know, first of all, my thinking on that would be, do you know how hard it is to just pretend to be knocked out? You know, unless you're saying, okay, they, they took the shot willingly, didn't flinch, and didn't brace enough to not be knocked out. So you're saying if that didn't happen, like they just let, you know, either they let themselves be knocked out and didn't brace or flinch, or the punches weren't hard enough to actually knock them out cold, and they took a face-first dive onto the canvas as part of an act, in which I also don't believe because I don't think they're good enough actors to pull that off especially in the moment without heavy, you know, it just, it looks more real than any boxing scene you've ever watched in a movie. So to me on the face, that's ridiculous. But then the reason you can come to me and, and explain a conspiracy theory that you have some belief, but it better be grounded in something. And what I find is a lot of people regurgitate the same exact things, right? You'll see this video uh, where people are claiming, Look at, look at how Jake Paul moves his hand before he punches Tyron in the face. And this is a signal to Tyron that, to drop his hand so that he can hit you clean in the face and knock you out cold and make your face hit the canvas before anything else does and possibly risk more brain damage just from the impact of your head to the floor. So even that assertion, you know, that, that his hand movement was... Uh, weird or uncharacteristic in some way, I question that. Hand movement looked normal to me. Then the second part is you're endowing a meaning to it. Like it meant this, you know, so the first, even just the first two steps, there's no evidence for that. Uh, I was looking up conspiracy theories and sort of what the, the definition is because I find this a fascinating <sighs> broad category for 
America, especially politics, and I'm, I'm fascinated by people who buy into conspiracy theories. I do think people have sort of conspiratorial brains and personalities that people are more susceptible to thinking this way. And I'm not saying all conspiracies, uh, conspiracy theories are false. Um, obviously, Avril Lavigne died and was replaced by a doppelganger in, what was it, 2006? That's just a fact. Um, I do actually believe that, that Courtney Love murdered Kurt Cobain or had him murdered. I think that's a very compelling case just because all the, the evidence, the circumstantial and forensic evidence points to that, that, you know, he's firing a shotgun with the wrong arm because <laughs> he's left-handed. It's over here and everything gets put away neatly after he blows his brains out and he has a lethal dose of heroin in his system at the time that uh, he fires the, the gun on himself, but then somehow puts everything neatly back into his little heroin case. So none of it makes sense. And obviously there's an incentive and a motive. Um, I just don't see that with Tyron Woodley. I see that he, he really wanted to win. You know, this is a five-time UFC champion. You think he doesn't have an ego? You think he can really be bought? You didn't think that he's looking forward to having a bigger boxing fights after this? I believe all that. You know, I just don't believe he has the temperament to take a dive. But wanted to look into and read out this, just went on Wikipedia and wanted to read about conspiracy. A conspiracy theory is an explanation for an event or situation that invokes a conspiracy by sinister and powerful groups. When other explanations are more probable, key term there, right? The term has a negative connotation implying that the appeal to a conspiracy is based on prejudice or insufficient evidence. A conspiracy theory is not the same as a conspiracy. Instead, it refers to a hypothesized conspiracy with specific characteristics such as an opposition to the mainstream consensus among those people, such as scientists or historians, who are qualified to evaluate its accuracy. Conspiracy theories resist falsification and are reinforced by circular reasoning. Both evidence against the conspiracy and an absence of evidence for it are reinterpreted as evidence of its truth whereby the conspiracy becomes a matter of faith rather than something that can be proven or disproven. Um, some researchers suggest that conspiracist ideation, belief in conspiracy theories, may be psychologically harmful or pathological, and that it is correlated with lower analytical thinking, low intelligence, psychological projection, paranoia, and Machiavellianism. Uh, psychologists usually attribute belief in conspiracy theories and finding a conspiracy where there is none to a number of psychological conditions, such as paranoia, uh, schizophrenia, narcissism, insecure attachment, or to a form of cognitive bias called illusory pattern perception. However, the current scientific consensus holds that most conspiracy theorists are not pathological, precisely because their beliefs ultimately rely on cognitive tendencies that are neurologically hardwired in the human species and probably have deep uh, evolutionary origins, including natural inclinations towards anxiety and agency detect uh, detection. I thought that was interesting because it says that this is all kind of, it can be correlated with low intelligence and these personality disorders like paranoia, Machiavellianism, uh, narcissism, uh, projection, you know, like the classic model of, uh, you know, the girlfriend or boyfriend who's paranoid about the other partner cheating and it turns out that they're cheating, right? I always talk about projection because it's such an easy way to evaluate certain scenarios that might seem cliche, but it's often accurate. I don't know. Like, so maybe, I don't know, you're, you're looking at this going, who took a dive? And it's saying something about maybe you take a dive for a few million bucks. I mean, you know, many people probably would, but and it's harder to actually empathize with the real mind state of somebody who's a former UFC champion who has much more pride than that. Um, but I liked a couple things there talking about how this is a deeply human characteristic. I know it is because people, um, we can't always have perfect evidence and perfect information. So we rely on these bits to extrapolate the whole. You look at a, a drop of water and think you understand the ocean. And uh, I try to battle these tendencies as a human because I know that I just should not believe anything that I don't have evidence for. And unless there's some grand evidence for Jake Paul paying Tyron Woodley to get knocked out because he thought that he couldn't knock out Tyron Woodley, a guy who he already beat, uh, having won all his or most of his fights by KO so far. Um, if there's any evidence for that, and think about how many people would have to be involved. Remember Conor McGregor against Cowboy Cerrone. People thought that was a dive as if Conor McGregor doesn't have the pride 
You know, like he looked at his cowboy store and he thought, man, I need to pay this guy to lose to me, right? And the risk that you're taking on, how many people are, need to be involved in that? Every person in that deal, even if it's just four people, you can't tell a single soul because the exponential increase in percentage likelihood of it being found out that occurs each additional person that gets added to this situation. I remember reading about a mathematical model of that type of thing to say like, you know, 9-11 conspiracy, like, you know how many thousands of people would have to be involved in that? It would be, it would get found out in a day. Um, you know, a conspiracy involving two people, a little bit harder, but the more people you get involved, the more that you leave this, uh, you know, any sort of paper trail or evidence or get, you know, how does that agreement happen? Well, it doesn't, and you don't have anything but your feelings. And as the great American lawyer Ben Shapiro always says, facts don't care about your feelings. Sorry, smart guys. All right, so for this week's champion of the week, you know who we're doing? We're doing my cat, Spider. Why? Because he exhibited all these traits that I actually talk about uh, on this podcast a lot, okay? He was out in the rain, in the cold, he survived. He's resilient. He didn't give up. Um, he didn't have any cuddles from his favorite human for a week. Can you believe, can you, can you even comprehend the psychological horror he must have been in from not being around his favorite human, aka me? It must have been so difficult and, and, and so trying for him to not have his little cans of tuna and his little treats and his little snuggles. He likes to snuggle on a blankie. You know, if you get him going, if you pet him and, and work him up, he, he, he needs and he, and he uh, suckles on a blanket because he was taken away from his mother at a very young age by a, a well-meaning homeless guy. But he's like, oh, yeah, I saw the three brothers and then I took this guy. I'm like, yeah, like you took this four-week-old cat <laughs> away from its mom just because it walked over you. Cool. But needless to say, a spider's an orphan, so he didn't have a mommy. So he still suckles as an adult cat. It's so cute. Um you know, he was almost a homeless cat there for a second, but he made the right choice and he returned back to his family and other cats, you know, maybe they, they would have joined that street life. Some cats are for the streets and they stay homeless and the other homeless cats are probably like, it's so cool out here. You do whatever you want. No humans are telling you what to do. Did you have to stay inside all the time or what to eat and when to eat and putting little, you know, reindeer ears on you and taking pictures with it. None of that stuff, dude. It's chill out here. And Spider was like almost tempted by it, I feel like. You know, he spent a few days examining and trying out that lifestyle, but ultimately he realized that his community is more important to him. The three cats, the three female cats, his little harem, Vixen, Wolfie, Yoko, they need him. They need a man in their life. Uh, he's not going to let them be single cats. Okay, and, and, and all the consequences that come with that that we've studied uh, anthropologically. So, Spider, I just want to commend you. You're doing great work. You made the right decision, calling out. You were humble enough to admit that you needed help, and you meowed, and we came and got you. And everything's all good. <laughs> all right, we got a hater of the week this week that, like I told you guys, it's not just about being mean to me. It's not just about having the best roast or whatever, which can be. But what I try to highlight sometimes is a good effort. Now, this guy is somebody who comments a lot on my page uh, antagonistically like 100% of the time. But <laughs> he did uh, the timestamps, which nobody else has done. So he did the timestamp for this last episode. And I have to applaud him on actually watching the entire episode and giving chronological accuracy to the timestamps. Uh, now, he breaks it down in a way that <laughs> I think is funny. It's kind of like the, uh, the Internet is a Toilet podcast. Like each little thing I'll have an issue with that I can be like, well, that's not true. But so he's describing everything in, in the least charitable terms possible. Um, you know, the first part, BGL tries to shill some merch for a dicey associate. Uh, BGL's cat is missing. BGL seems to still have that 30 turmeric coffee thing happening. Uh, he makes fun of me discussing the McGregor bulk picks. 
that came up out a few weeks ago, lots of throat clearing, conclusion after lots of word salads and laughing at his own jokes, is he might be saucy. Uh, Jim Freak section, minute 24, lots of rambling about leverages. BGL seems a bit lost, a bit of hair scratching, voice is getting better. Strange prison joke in there. Um, BGL links to a thick guy he's been checking out on Instagram lately, seems to get a real kick out of his shirtless pics, no coughing. or So a lot of like, you're not funny, uh, Everything's a word salad. You don't understand this. You look lost, which I disagree with all, but it's funny. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, uh, hypercritical timestamps. That's what I'll call them. But it's funny because it's actually like, if the timestamps are accurate, then you can use them. Now, he accused me of deleting the comments before. I've never deleted a single comment on the haters will say uh, page. But sometimes YouTube auto deletes comments. <clears throat> like if there is certain word, like if you say pussy or something, that it'll like you'll you'll post the comment and it just won't be there. So I think that's what happens. Um, let's see on my Academy of Bro Science section, he says BGL says the term progressive overload, then lists a bunch of different training variables, but doesn't give any way of assembling those variables into a coherent plan to accomplish the term he thinks he was talking about. Oh, I know the term that I was talking about, progressive overload, and I don't need to give you an entire plan and how to assemble those variables. I'm just talking about what those variables are and you can increase or decrease all of them in order to achieve progressive overload. Um, lots of glances to the laptop for this and alludes to MRV but doesn't seem to know what it means. Uh, maximum recoverable volume, which I didn't go into. I assume he's mistaking that either accidentally or on purpose for me not knowing it because I said I won't go into it now. But I literally didn't want to go into it now. Uh, I want to go into it today because it's an interesting topic that requires a few minutes to, I think, get a clear picture on that. BGL admits that haters featured on the podcast up to this point have been fictitious. So another thing that's actually totally false because I admitted the, hey, that hurts. Jokes who weren't attributed to anyone were things that I wrote, just general insults. But every other hater has been totally real. Anybody that I've shown screenshots of or, or read an exchange with has been totally real. So one of the things that my haters like to do is also tell me I don't have any haters, you know, so they'll come in and like shit on me every week and then be like, you don't even have any haters. It's like, but you're, you're the hater. You're one of them. Um, and just because I wrote some jokes at my own expense to encourage people and start to springboard that into the new segment that I'm doing where I post pictures and let people rip on me and then uh, read out the best comments, it's sort of related, right? But I just wanted to get the ball rolling uh, by taking, you know, some of these ideas that people have tried to roast me with and actually turning them into jokes. Because again, when you come with animosity, it's a little bit harder. It just tends to be less fun. It tends to be repetitive. I use the term racist because it's ideological. You're going into the situation already not liking me. And I think that closes up your mind to an original observation. You kind of just have to like repeat the things that you said. Um, and I noticed this, I'm going to end there. And I think, so thank you for making the timestamps. And if you keep doing it, it'll be useful and you can, you know, uh, vent whatever animosity you have towards me in those uncharitable descriptions of each segment. I wanted to parlay that, um, into something that I forgot. <laughs> I, oh, I was on the Stevie Weeby show, which I brought up before, but I noticed a lot in the comments there too, that versus on um, some people will come to hate on this show and you can tell they'll be like, this show sucks. And I'm like, cool specifics. You know, you can't just tell me something sucks and not be specific and have it land. Right. So that's a hater. Hateration 101 is don't just come and tell me this sucks. I mean, that's cool if that's your opinion, but it doesn't land unless you say something specific. Did you, and then I'll be like, did you watch the whole show? And they're like, I didn't watch anything of it. Okay, but it sucks. You're sure of that, right? So just, it's a funny little trap that I've seen multiple people walk into. They don't realize that like, in order to tell me it sucks, you would have had to watch the whole thing, but their ego can't allow them to <laughs> admit that they actually did watch the whole thing. And I think that's a pretty common phenomenon amongst, you know, people. People are really shitting on you in detail. It's like, oh, you seem to really pay attention to me. And then, what, I don't pay attention to, oh, so you're not paying attention to me. You're just pulling shit out of your ass? Which is it? Um, when I was on the Stevie Weeby podcast, it was cool to see a bunch of people like kind of admit, oh, I didn't think this was going to be a good episode or I was turned off by the picture or whatever. And that's pretty common with me. A lot of people have told me that, you know, that they'll, and I think that's common for anybody. Um, you get judged 
on your appearance to be one way, and, and perhaps people can be pleasantly surprised. If they're unpleasantly surprised because they thought something positive and then negative, you're probably not going to hear about that. So I know this is a bias towards like people thinking something nice and then finding you uh, approachable enough to actually share that with you because not everybody wants to admit that uh, they didn't like you at first or they thought it was going to be one way. But it's always cool to see that the people will come and think like, oh, I'm not going to be into this meathead or he looks like a douchebag or he looks like whatever you want to assess me based on my appearance as I sometimes forget because I don't think that much about like, you know, if you're on this channel and not used to a buff guy coming on, what are you going to, you know, project onto me from your own brain? And of course, some people will be on there like steroids uh, making these jokes. And it's like if Stevie would have asked me about that, I would have been happy to go into it, it's just we didn't. So I think that's always a funny thing. It's like the, f the first attack has to be like, steroids! It's like, uh, you know, as if you're like uncovering a secret or something, uh, which you're not. <laughs> but it's also telling, those are pretty rare. But it was cool in general to see, you know, people giving it a chance and getting something out of it. And so even if you're watching my entire podcast just to shit on me with timestamps, <laughs> I appreciate the fact that you're watching the whole podcast and maintaining somewhat of an open mind to at least take in the information and report it somewhat accurately. Okay, on this week's This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Gyms, we're actually stepping out of the gym for a second and onto the bodybuilding stage where we are going to examine uh, a, a video, an event, uh, an occurrence, a phenomenon that is sweeping the internet by storm, and it has to do with fat bodybuilding. So this, before I set this up, before I get into what happened recently, I just wanted to show a clip from the Joe Rogan experience where he actually has this guy on who was somebody who was writing these fake woke papers um, that did a number of them, but they would take sort of these ridiculous stances and then troll the academic community or and specifically like the social sciences um, you know, gender studies and whatnot by writing these ridiculous papers that were satirical but using academic language in order to fool people that they were sincere and they were effective at doing that. One of them was uh, fat bodybuilding saying, you know, if you, if a muscular guy builds his body up and gets really big, then a fat person can, can do just the same and we shouldn't have this criteria that you need to have muscles in order to be a bodybuilder and We'll just play this for a minute. And yeah, fat bodybuilding. Sense. Fat bodybuilding. Um, so it turns out Peter has a friend named Richard Baldwin. And you should pull Richard Baldwin up. Richard Baldwin is a real professional bodybuilder. He was like, what was it, Mr. Uh, Olympia 1978 or something, right? And he's also a history professor. So the dude's jacked. Even 70-something, he's jacked. And so uh, he said we could use his identity to do our papers. Yeah, that's so, him as in the seventies. Yeah, I mean, n that is that him now? Um, he's got a one in a black T-shirt where it's like he's seventy-one years old, and it, it's it's just insane. Oh, the, up, the upper that's level. back in the day. Upper, upper, yeah. The one, the one where he's doing the most muscular pose, right there. Bam. Um, he's still like that. And Jesus ooh. Christ! So he let us use his identity. Uh, that that's him older. He's still jacked. I mean, he's wow, sixty-five there. He's in, he's fit. So we were like, we got to write bodybuilding themed papers because we have a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And so we claim that his, his, there is the black one, the related images down there is where he's in the black t-shirt. I actually photoshopped a copy of that, that specific image and put fat bodybuilder on the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have that picture. <laughs> That's him. Like when he was letting us use his identity. Um, so there he's in his 70s. I think he's like 71 there. That's insane. Yeah. Look at those arms. Wow. And, um, yeah, so we wrote this paper, Fat Bodybuilding, saying that uh, bodybuilders are abnormally large. Fat people are abnormally large. Muscle and fat are just two types of tissue, and it's only fatphobic science that distinguishes their worth. And <laughs> fatphobic society that says one means more than the other. Okay, we can end there. So I... <laughs> couple terms there, fatphobic science that, you know, uh, says they're different and fat phobic uh, society that says one is worth more than the other. Now that leads up to this clip, uh, that link at the top there, um, where Nick strength of power is. And if you go to, yeah, keep clicking through, let's see here, go to five Oh five. Um, just to get a, a shot of this guy. 
This guy does have some muscle. We could just play that. We could play him talking about the it. The best of the best. And I also agree that really the best of the best should be what we see on the national stage. And I also agree that a physique like this is not representative of the best of the best that we expect to see okay. on the national stage. We could pause that. So basically there's been an uproar over this guy, a lot of controversy because he stepped on stage looking like this. Now, the guy obviously has muscle underneath there. It's just that he's totally unprepared for a bodybuilding show as far as looking like uh, he has the kind of body fat percentage that we've come to expect, uh, sub double digits, um, it, it would be the norm at, at even amateur natural shows. Uh, he's in the 35% range uh, as far as body fat. Looks like he has a lot of muscle under there, but it's totally covered by enormous layers. Well, not enormous, but, you know, he's a big fat dude. And there's a couple takeaways from this. For anybody who looks at this and says, he shouldn't be competing, that's wrong, or that's stupid, or it's making a mockery. I, first of all, I don't think anybody's that hardcore of a bodybuilding fan that they're going to take offense to this. Uh and if you do, I'd love to hear your thoughts on why you think he shouldn't compete. But here's my arguments for why he should. And even the backlash that you might get is totally uh, warranted and fair game uh, and why it's different than fat shaming. We have a guy on stage here uh, who, in order to get to NPC Nationals, you have to qualify. So he did something along the way to qualify for this, playing by the rules. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he was in shape. It could be that he was in shape earlier in the year, did a show to qualify and won legitimately against other competitors and then showed up deliberately out of shape uh, or his training wasn't going well and he said, I'm going to do it anyway and, and court the attention. Or he could have competed in such – because he is a super heavyweight. Maybe you go to a show where there, you're the only super heavyweight and you win that local show to qualify for nationals – by default, so there's actually no competition, and he could have looked just like this, knowing that nobody else is going to compete. Um, but he did play by the rules, and so it's sort of like sometimes when you see in the Olympics, you know, like the Jamaican bobsled team or whatever, I don't know if they actually came in last, but an analogy like that or, or some country that just doesn't, they're not good at weightlifting, they're not good at swimming, and they just get demolished by everybody else. But they qualified via the rules for the Olympics, uh, and the rules within their own country to be the representative for the Olympics. So you can't take that away from them uh, unless you want to have some sort of minimum standard. You know, you have to hit that actual freestyle. It doesn't matter if you're the best in, the, in your entire country. You could be the best swimmer in Zimbabwe, and if you don't swim 100 meters in under two minutes, you just can't be on the Olympic team. But that doesn't seem to be the case uh, where they're providing these you know, minimum bars for entry into the Olympics. Similarly here, this guy would have to, in order to be disqualified from a show for looking fat, you'd have to have some sort of objective measurement uh, beyond weight. Now, some categories do have weight classes. Um, the 212 category, men's, uh, men's classic bodybuilding has a, a weight limit based on your own height. Um, but short of that, in order to say somebody's too fat or out of shape to compete, you need to get out calipers and say like, oh, you if you're not 10% body fat, uh, you can't step on stage, which is just hard to see happening. And uh, applying that logic, you'd go to a beauty uh, pageant or something like that and measure people's faces to say, oh, ugly people, it is a beauty pageant and the winner is supposed to be beautiful and this is a celebration of beauty. And ugly people can't show up. And how are we going to determine ugly Um you know, measuring people's facial symmetry or something. It's a slippery slope that I think is just too complicated to go down. So you end up having stuff like this. Now, is making fun of this guy, is broadcasting it, is putting his name and image out there, is that the same thing as fat shaming? Do I even believe in fat shaming? Sure, you can make fun of fat people who don't want the attention and perhaps that might work as a tactic for some people. I'm not sure. And I actually, you know, I think there is a lot of evidence to suggest that it's not like when you see shows like The Biggest Loser and they're just being screamed at all the time. I don't think that's a good long-term, maybe a short-term strategy for, for shaming people into actually doing something, if that's what you mean by fat shaming, um, trying to motivate them. I take a different approach where I try to incentivize people you know, and empower people. <laughs> not to toot my own horn, I just feel like that's more effective. You know, if, if ripping on somebody and calling them a fat piece of shit every single day worked, maybe I'd do that. But I just find that people who are really out of shape 
typically do well with positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement. Um, so this guy knew exactly what he was doing, though, which I find hilarious because he's trolling at the end of the day. He's up there with a smile. In, he put that Speedo on. He knows what he's doing. He knows he's a thick brick of chocolate. He knows he's a tasty chocolate bar that we're all eyeing in the, in the store and going, mm, I like that one. You know, the other ones might have less calories, but this one looks delicious, and I can't take my eyes off it. So congrats to this dude. It's hilarious. I'm not going to say, like, it's bold and it's powerful. It's so brave. It's not brave. It's just funny. Uh, it takes balls to do that <laughs> and know that you're going to go viral, but it's also smart. This dude's kind of famous now. Um, you know, he's got a body like Derek Lewis doing bodybuilding shows. Derek Lewis before he got leaner, I should say that. Derek Lewis is probably leaner than this dude uh, when he fights now at heavyweight. So congrats to this dude. Uh, fat bodybuilder, you know, you made it all come true for that guest of Joe Rogan. Fat bodybuilding's a real thing, and I'm here to support it because I'm woke as fuck. All right, for this week's Bro Science Academy, as promised, I want to go into a topic that has to do with what you should be doing in the weight room and how to figure out what's best for you to grow. What's the minimum uh, it's going to take for you to get results? What's the minimum it's going to take to retain your results, even if you can't work out as much as you want to? And then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, what is the upper limit of sets and volume you can do each week before it becomes detrimental? This is an interesting topic that I can't provide super concrete answers on everything, but I'm going to share with you my understanding of this in case you don't know as much. Um, so we'll start with the idea of minimum effective volume. Obviously, doing nothing is not going to be effective, right? Zero sets a week of bench press is not going to increase your bench press. However, could one set of bench press increase your bench press? Well, actually it could. If you're untrained, if you're new, or even if you're not, but you do a really intense set of bench, um, I've had great results from low volume programs that you incorporate a super high intensity with, maybe pushing past failure with forced reps or other uh, drop sets techniques that allow that one set, maybe rest pause where it's still a, a set, but you rack it for a little bit and do some more reps. You can make improvements on very little. However, there is a scientific consensus and then also people who kind of expand this idea, which is between 10 and 20 sets per muscle group per week is looked at as a rough uh, ideal for how to get the best gain. So if you're doing hitting chest twice a week with five hard working sets, that would be on the low end. And there's evidence to suggest that below 10 sets, your gains are going to be significantly lower. And once you go past 10, uh, your, your gains from below that 10 set threshold might even as much as double. However, going from 10 sets to say 20 sets, right? If you did two workouts and you did 10 hard sets a week or, you know, uh, let's say a couple, you know, you did chest f three times and you did seven sets each, right? Would be another one to hit 20 or more. <sighs> Your results don't necessarily double. In fact, it might only, it might only increase an in increment from 10 sets to 20 sets. So you can get more gains by going up to 20. Is it going to double? No, that's not how it works. You know, 10 sets versus 20 sets versus 30 sets isn't going to be like this much gains and then twice as much and then three times as much. Uh, so you have to be aware of that, that there is a groove for you as a person and where you're at in uh, your training journey, because obviously if you're beginner or intermediate, those lower number of sets, you're, you can be lower on the spectrum and still get great results, right? Um, others have suggested that even up to 30, because this is something that's hard to study, like, how, you know, are they studying people that do 50 sets a week? Probably not. Um, but, you know, I have seen uh, at least one expert talk about how 30 sets, you know, would be better than 20. They're just, and, and, and he talked about how it's hard to know what the upper limit of it is. They haven't actually studied a group of athletes in which they did such a high volume that the results diminished by going up you can start to see how if you increase your 
uh, uh, sets to a certain point, you won't get any more. You, you'll just incur more uh, fatigue and need more recovery, uh, but you won't get any more results per se. So it's possible that going from 20 sets to 30 sets will yield no improvements, just more soreness, uh, more time in the gym, more fatigue, you know, central nervous system fatigue, and you'll need to sleep more and eat more, et cetera, to recover from that. Um, but it's possible if you experiment with it, the 30 sets a week might get you better results. So the scientific consensus with the maximum recoverable volume, which is the number of sets each week that you can even recover from and be ready to do your next workout, right? Uh, that is a lot more vague. We don't quite understand it, but you can imagine, like I said, with zero, zero is gonna do nothing. A million sets in a week will probably give you diminishing returns because even just fitting that in means you wouldn't have any time to sleep, right? So we understand that somewhere in there is a maximum recoverable volume. Uh, some people would suggest it's between 20 and 30, maybe up to 40, depending on the body part, but we don't really know. What we do have more specific information is are those minimums. And you can also look at different exercises in different body parts and distinguish between, for example, doing hard sets of deadlifts each week, right? That's an exercise that's going to incur more fatigue and you probably have a lower uh, threshold of, uh, for maximum recoverable volume when it comes to deadlifts and even using, for example, the hamstrings are, an, are a body part that both requires one uh, set to keep your gains. If you've built up hamstrings and you want, you can't work out fully. If you did one hard set a week, you could actually maintain the gains that you have on your hamstrings. Um, and you only need about four sets a week to improve them at minimum. Something like medial delts, which can handle a lot more volume. And also the, uh, many of the exercises we use for them just don't, they're not as heavy doing side lateral raises with 20 pounds, which I'll use 20 pounds for workout. Uh, you know, I could do five sets of those every single day and I probably would still not overwork my medial delts. So muscle to muscle, it's different. Uh, and individual to individual, it's different. But as I mentioned before in last week's Bro Science Academy, there are all these different training variables that you can increase or decrease uh, as you pursue progress. If you're just pursuing hypertrophy or some other element of performance, um, you can play around with these different variables that I mentioned before, and today it's just talking about the number of sets. If you're if you got results and now you're plateauing, try upping the sets. Uh, try looking into somebody like Jeff Nippert or Mike Isretel that they have videos that break down literally each muscle. You know, minimum effective volume, maximum recover volume, and the minimum you'd need to do in order to some some. Uh, muscles like the biceps, you actually don't need any sets to maintain the muscle if you're also doing back work, right? So it's a zero uh, is the minimum to keep what you have if you're also doing something like, you know, lat pull downs or rows. So I thought that was an interesting topic and just something that it's one of the easiest ways to troubleshoot when you're stuck and you're not getting the results after you've been doing a certain program for a while. You can ask yourself, can I do some more high quality sets? Most people can. And it's probably pretty rare that you're overdoing it truly. However, I do meet some guys that do these high volume workouts and I'm like, you know you're skinny, right? Like, you know this isn't working. You've been the same size for two years. You do 40 sets of chest every time you come in, but you're just not doing them intensely enough to see any progress. So maybe when you look at me doing five sets of bench and growing off that, take a note, okay? I'm not just here giving this information away for no reason, okay? Look at me and follow what I do. It, it, I'm buff. Thank you so much for watching this entire episode. And if you want to do this timestamps and make fun of me, go ahead and do that too. We can have competing timestamps to see who can make fun of me or rebut that negative timestamp with a positive timestamp of your own where you actually give me glowing praise. I, I, you know, I'm not saying like do that. Like I don't care either way, but if you want to do it, sure. Like that'd be, you know, a super awesome Christmas gift to me, just as an example of something that you could do that nobody's forcing you to, but if you wanted to, like, sure, I'll, I'll read it. <laughs>